This week we are talking about blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. It's the last beatitude. I'm finally getting through them after like a year and a half or whatever. So, um, And I was just thinking about, you know, when you're going through a difficult time in life, one of the most encouraging things that can happen is somebody who's been through the same thing you've been through and you talking to them and them just listening to you and saying, you know what, I know how you feel. I've been there and encouraging you. This is how I got through it. You know, it's one thing when someone's like, yeah, that, that must suck, you know. But like when someone's been through it, when someone's lost, when you've lost a spouse and you meet someone who lost a spouse, when you've lost a child and you meet someone who's lost a child, and you can talk with them and share, and they know, really know, it can be one of the most encouraging things, right? Like, and especially when you're doing something hard. Like, this is why when they're running marathons, they've got all those people lined up encouraging you because it's like, don't quit, you know? And the last thing you want to do is quit in front of all these people who are encouraging you. I remember one time I was jogging in my neighborhood and I was tired. And then this car drove by and they're like, yeah, keep going. And it's like, okay, I'm not going to quit now. I'm going to wait until they get around the corner. <laughs> I don't want to quit in front of them. So, I mean, when somebody is encouraging you to keep going, that makes a big difference, right? And the Bible is like that. You know, so much of the Bible, if you really want to understand the Bible, you've got to understand that so much of it was written by people who were suffering for Christ, and they were writing to people who were suffering for Christ, right? So the letters, so much of the New Testament is written by people who were in the middle of suffering, and they're writing to others who are suffering. And that's why there's so many verses in the Bible, if you summarize it, that basically say, don't quit, keep going, it's worth it, there's a reward at the end, you know? So many verses in the Bible, it's Paul or somebody else saying, don't give up on the hope that you have, keep pressing in, and due season you're going to reap if you don't faint. Um, and I was thinking about, as I was preparing for the sermon, how like, the Bible really comes alive when you are... The, the Holy Spirit can really bring the Bible alive when you are in the middle of being persecuted for Jesus or when, really just when you're in the middle of living for Jesus like the disciples were, you know? It's like that kid who he finds this book in his house and it's how to survive in the jungle. And he opens it up and it's a bunch of random information about trees and leaves and what not to eat and how to start a fire with wet wood. And he's like, this is boring, you know? And so he just puts it back on the shelf. But then one day, him and his dad are hiking, and they don't bring a compass, which if they read the book, they would have brought a compass. And they get lost. And they're stuck in the woods for two weeks until they can find a way out. But the dad bring, did bring that book. And all of a sudden, that book became a whole lot more interesting, because now they need it, right? Everything in that book is necessary for survival. And I feel like that's the way it is with the Bible. Like, when you are living for Jesus, when your number one pursuit is to seek his kingdom first, this becomes a whole lot more interesting because everything in here applies to your life. I think sometimes the Bible is boring because Jesus is not something we're really centering our lives around, you know? And so this doesn't really come alive to us like it would if we were really seeking the kingdom first. So just something I was thinking about. But we're going to look at this book about persecution. If you got your Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew 5. 1 through 12, and we're going to read them all, all the Beatitudes, and if you don't have your Bible, it's up on the screen, Matthew 5, 1 through 12. It says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and mutter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, last week, Scott talked quite a bit about how um, that... Scott talked quite a bit about how we should expect difficulty in the Christian life, right? Uh, he actually texted me earlier in the week and was like, I don't want to steal your thunder. 
And then uh, he talked quite a bit about it, so I was like, well, I'll have to figure out how to do it this week. But uh, <laughs> love you, Scott. I'm just messing with him. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, and it was, he talked about how it takes endurance and how opposition is guaranteed, right? And again, understanding the Bible, like persecution was normal to the early Christian church. We know that, right? Um, and as long as there's evil in the world, persecution is going to be part of the Christian life. And so what I wanted to do this week, I think we all know that persecution is expected as a Christian and all that, but I wanted to kind of zoom out, take like a 30,000 foot view of persecution in the Bible, and just kind of go over it and ask ourselves why are we persecuted? And all these, all these questions that relate to it, because I think it's a good topic to know about. You know, like right now we're not in a time where we're really heavily persecuted for following Jesus. But throughout the centuries, so many people have been and there's always a chance that persecution will come to America, just like it has in China and Iran and many other countries, right? And so we as a church need to know what the Bible has to say about it and be ready for it. So the first question I wanted to ask is, why are we persecuted? And I think if you're really going to boil it down, the reason the early church is persecuted, true persecution, okay? And I'll, I say true persecution for a reason, but true persecution is a result of truth and love rubbing the world the wrong way, Right? And Jesus said this was going to happen. He said, this is a judgment that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because the works are evil. So everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light that lest his works should be exposed. And it's interesting how Paul describes his message because he says, the message of the cross to the world is foolishness. He says that in 1 Corinthians 1. In Galatians, he says, the cross is an offense to the world. It's an offense. It's an offending thing. And the reason it's offensive, I think, is because it rubs against the grain of broken humanity. The truth of God and the love of God rubs against the grain of broken humanity. It's interesting, you know, to think about why the apostles were persecuted. As I was thinking about it, I was like, why did they get into so much trouble? And I was thinking about, like, these two things came to my mind, and there's probably more reasons, but just think about it. Like, on the one hand, the Pharisees and the Jews persecuted the apostles because they reject, the apostles rejected the Old Testament religion. They rejected the law. They rejected circumcision. They said, this is not what it takes to be right with God anymore, only Jesus. And so they're upsetting this whole religious culture, and the Jews hated it. So the Jews, uh, the Jews that didn't believe in Jesus, they persecuted, many of them persecuted the apostles, right? But then on the other hand, they would get persecuted by the Romans and by Greeks and stuff like that because they rejected pantheism. They, were, they said Jesus is the only God. Remember, he goes to Athens, and there's all these inscriptions and all these statues to gods. And he says, hey, I want to tell you about the one true God. And in times past, God has kind of winked at all of our idolatry, but now he commands you to repent and to worship Jesus alone. And, uh, you know, like the entire book of Galatians, going back to the Jews, is basically talking about how circumcision and the law are an old covenant that's passing away, and it's not necessary. And you got to think about this. Like, for the Jews, circumcision was like the thing. It would be like us telling you, like, it would be like somebody telling you, Jesus is not an important part of your religion. You don't need Jesus. You'd be like, Jesus is everything. That makes me who I am. And that was how circumcision was to them. It was like their mark of, de- of definitiveness. This is, makes me a Jew. It defines me as one of God's people. It shows that I am part of the chosen race. And they say circumcision doesn't matter. It rubbed them the wrong way, but it was true. It was the truth. But they didn't want to receive it because Jesus wasn't the Messiah they were looking for. It rubbed them the wrong way, right? Another story I was thinking about is how in Ephesus, like they, all these people start becoming followers of Jesus, and they burn all their books and their sorcery and their witchcraft, and they make this huge burning. And the people who persecute the apostles, they cause a riot in the city, are the people who are selling the idols, and they're not making as much money anymore. So they start this riot in Ephesus, and the apostles have to leave. Um, And it's interesting. So, like, you know, you see that, like, the two main things I was seeing is, like, on the one hand, they're rejecting Judaism. On the other hand, they're rejecting pantheism. But I was thinking about something deeper of why persecution happens, right? Like, why, like, with the Jews, it wasn't just about that their religion was being threatened. 
I think it was deeper. I think it was that it was threatening their control. It was threatening their status. You know, if Jesus was true, then the Pharisees were not anybody special anymore, right? They're just like anybody else. And everything they've lived for their whole life is now obsolete. And they're just like anybody else, just like the Gentiles, right? And it threatened what they, it threatened their pride, basically, you know? And, and the same with the people who persecute them for, in Ephesus. It's like, it wasn't so much about Diana of the Ephesians that they were mad about, that people weren't worshiping her anymore. They were mad because they weren't making any money from selling the idols, right? And when you really get down to it, I think the cross is offensive because Jesus challenges your sovereignty over your life, right? Jesus threatens your control of your life. If Jesus is king, that means you're not. His word and ways are truth, and that means any con- anything contrary to that is not. And that is what really makes people mad, is that Jesus has a standard and a definition, and he's king, and that means I have to lay down my control and my authority of my life, and I have to submit to him, and I don't want to do that, right? And we can cover it up with all kinds of ways, but people don't want a God that tells them what the truth is. You know, it's interesting. Has anybody seen the movie Soul? Anybody seen that movie? Uh, none of y'all have seen the movie Soul? Or you have? Okay. Some of y'all have. Okay. So, so it's interesting. This guy dies, right? And I won't give away the whole movie. It's, an, it's a cool movie. I'm not hating on it too much. But what's interesting to me is that he dies and he goes to like this afterlife kind of heavenish type thing. Actually, oh, never mind. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to ruin it. But he goes to like this afterlife kind of heavenish type thing. But there's, and it was like happy and everything's good there. It's sunny and 73 degrees. It's like heaven, right? The only thing that wasn't there was God. And I was like, isn't that the way people want it? They want a heaven. They want everything to be good. They just don't want God to be there. Instead of God, it was like these little like floating invisible creatures that like are kind of like, well, I'm going to make you, you know, hard headed. I'm going to make you, you know, they were just like these random forces that decided how the universe worked. But there's no God, right? And because there's no God, there's no standard. And it's, it's just as true today as it was back then. The reason the cross offends people is because it tells you this is the way things are. This is what God says. And we don't always want to bow to it, you know? People want to live by what's good for me is good for me, and what's good for you is good for you. That's the way our world wants to be. We see that, don't we? I mean, it's, it's so much nowadays that even to say to people, If God made you a man physically, then you are a man, and you should only marry and date women. That is considered a hateful thing to say because we want to define our own definition of gender and sexuality. We don't want God telling us what to do, right? To to tell somebody that abortion is murder, to tell somebody that fornication and, and relationship before marriage is evil, don't tell me that. It's love. I can do what I want. It's my body. I can do what I want, right? We, it, it's the same thing. It's like when God is there and his message is there, it's offensive because it says this is the truth. And if you're not in line with it, you're wrong. And we don't want people to tell us that, you know? And, and honestly, I mean, and I don't really see this in our church, but I just thought I might mention it. You know, pastors deal with this a lot. Because even in the church, people don't want pastors telling them they're wrong. You know, it's like, it's like keep it at the pulpit. Preach it from up there, but don't, don't you dare come to me and tell me what you think is wrong with my life. No, right? you don't have that place in my life or whatever. You know, it's like, and it really is just pride. We don't want, you know, most of the time. Now, pastors can be belligerent and pastors can abuse their authority, definitely. But a lot of times we don't want pastors telling us what to do because we don't, we're just proud, you know? And so persecution comes when the truth of God conflicts with the brokenness of the world. Now, I do want to say, though, Sometimes, and this is why I put true persecution on here, sometimes Christians, like the world, uh, is mad at Christians because Christians have gone about telling the truth the wrong way, right? That's why I say truth and love rubbing the world the wrong way. Because, like, for example, um, I went to, a friend of mine had this idea one time, let's go to the gay pride parade and let's hand out water bottles and just ask people if we can pray for them. Because the gay community at large has a very bad view of the church because the church has approached them in a bad way a lot of times, you know? 
And so it's like, we're not going to go out there to convert people. We're just going to go out there to love people. Because people out there, man, they get drunk in the middle of the day. It's hot. People are selling water bottles for like $4 a piece. So let's just go hand out water bottles, ask people we can pray for them. And we had some great discussions with people. I remember talking to somebody, a couple guys, and I was like, man, we could be friends. Like, if I had any way of like, you know, knowing them after I leave here, you know, like I, it's just some really cool people here, you know? So I remember standing on the corner and talking to these girls and we, we prayed with them, you know, and it was cool. And right across the street, there's this dude in like a fenced in area. He's got like these barricades, you know, and he's got a megaphone and he's looking at me. He's like, you're going to hell and you're going to hell. And, you know, I don't remember everything he said. God hates gay people and stuff like that, you know, and or God hates homosexuality, whatever, right? And so we pray for these girls, and then they're like, we're going to go over there, and we're going we're gonna to yell at him or something like that, right? And it was like a total contrast. Like, and they weren't yelling at him because he was telling the truth. They were yelling at him because he's being a jerk. Like, you know, and sometimes the way we have approached sharing the truth with people has turned people off, not because it's the truth, but because of our attitude and the way we've approached it. We've been flippant. We've been saying, well, if you don't agree with me, you're an idiot, you know? And we treated people like they're less than because they deal with a sin that we think is yucky, right? And, you know, we have the sins we're okay with, like, you know, if someone's living with someone outside of marriage, it's okay. But if someone's a homosexual, oh, you know, I don't like that. And so we have turned people off, not because we're telling the truth, but because of the way we approach them, right? And so true persecution comes, like, sometimes no matter how you approach people, whether it's truth or in love, you're going to get persecuted, right? But sometimes... We turn people off by the way we approach them. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's important to balance truth and love, right? It's important that we are not just going out there and telling the truth and being like, I don't care about you. We got to love people too. But sometimes even when we do that, we're going to be persecuted, right? And that's the way it was with the apostles. They loved people deeply and they told the truth, but they were still persecuted because what they said rubbed the grain of the world wrong. And that's going to happen, right? Now, How are we persecuted? Um, It comes in a lot of different ways. You know, for us in America, we don't see as much persecution as some places. But we do sometimes. Look at, if you have your Bible open to Matthew, look at what it says in verse 11. It says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Has anybody ever had somebody lie about them? Speak bad about them. You know, that word persecute is dioko, and it's, it's interesting. It's to make one run or flee, to put to flight, to drive away. It's when people push you out of your company and say, get away from me, you know? It's that kind of idea of, a, of I'm disgusted with you, you know? Paul shared a lot of his persecutions in 2 Corinthians. You can read it up here. Look at verse uh, 24. Well, I guess starting in verse 23. It says, uh, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, dangers from rivers, robbers, my own people, Gentiles, in the city, in the wilderness, at sea, from false brothers, Toil, hardship, many a sleepless night, hungry, thirsty, often without food, cold and exposed. It's interesting to me, it's just a side note, but one of the, there's this teaching out there called the prosperity gospel that says if you follow Jesus and you have enough faith, God will make you rich. And they use this verse in the beginning of, chapter, of Hebrews 11 that says, faith is the evidence of things not seen, the assurance of things hoped for. And so they say, see, if you have faith, all you have to do is speak what you want into existence. You believe it's there, and you'll receive it. So believe in, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I believe in your Mercedes, you know. Believe in, your, believe in your wealth coming through. Believe that your seed is going to prosper. But they never read the end of the passage, which is this right here. It says, what shall I say? Time would fail to tell me of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, the prophets, who through faith they conquered kingdoms. They enforced justice, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. They were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead back by resurrection. This sounds good so far, right? What a great life. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. 
Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. That's faith, right? That's faith to walk with God when the whole world is turned against you. Persecution takes many shapes and forms today. If you have your phone, I'd like you to whip your phone out, okay? And I want you to go to Google or your search browser, and I want you to look something up, because I want you to see it. I was going to think about putting a picture up here. When you get your browser open, go to the top and type in Christian sewage worker in Pakistan. Christian sewage worker in Pakistan. And then go to the images. And these guys, because they're Christians, and because of a Muslim society that puts down other minority religions, they are forced into menial jobs like cleaning the streets, cleaning the sewers. These guys will go into clogged sewers up to their neck in sewage and reach their hands into these pipes and pull out the refuse and pull out the sewage, and they have no hope of a better job because they're Christians. And what would happen if they converted to Islam? Maybe they could get a better future. And these guys, I was reading an article about one of them, how they, he said, I'm just thankful I know, so I'm like, I'm thankful I know Jesus is with me, you know? These guys die of lung disease, they get skin problems, and they do it to provide for their family because there's nothing else they can do because they're Christians. This is what persecution looks like. It's like being denied privileges or education because you're a Christian. It's like being derided and laughed at to prison to death. And this is, guys, it's important to know, this is not strange. Like, this is, what we have here in America is strange. For 2,000 years, the church has been known by persecution, the true Christians. Sometimes from the world and sometimes from the church. Like how in the Catholic church, or the, um, I forget what the other one was, but how they persecuted, like the Anabaptists and things like that. Just because they tried to hold to the scriptures. It's normal. And we need to know that. And we need to recognize that our call to follow Jesus is a call to suffer with him. Now, why do we endure the suffering? Why did the disciples tell the truth when persecution was the result? Why did they keep on preaching and sharing when they knew what the result was going to be? I think it's the same reason that Jesus kept preaching and sharing, even though he knew it would lead to his death. It was through love and obedience, right? Look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. He says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul had a love from God that said, no matter what I suffer for these people, I want them to know Jesus. I love how the Amplified puts this verse. It's, uh, you might have read it, the love of Christ constrains me, but in the Amplified, they try and really bring out the full meaning of the word. And it says, for the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us. He's talking about that in the context of being a minister. Like, this is why we do it, because the love of Christ controls me. You know, we've been talking about in our growth group how God is bringing us back to the place where he can show the world who he is through us. And as we walk with him, he begins to draw us into a love that he has for the world. That same burning passion and desire for people becomes ours. So, yeah, we do it out of obedience. But I think anybody who has been in ministry and has walked with God, they'll tell you, I don't just do this because I have to. I do it because I love the people that God has called me to. You know, I like how it's, I'm re, I've been studying through Colossians in my personal study, and it says, I, Paul is talking about a guy named Epaphras, and he says, I can testify about him, that he has a great zeal for you. And I was thinking, God, I want that, you know? I want to have that zeal for people. It's easy to get so caught up in our life and our things that we got going on, and, you know, we get into a routine with God and all that, and it's not bad, but I don't want to be like Jonah, you know? where he did the ministry, but he just did it because he had to. He went and told the Ninevites, but he didn't want to be there. I want to love people the way Jesus loved people. 
And I really think I could grow in that area. And I thought this was cool. They did it out of love and obedience. That's why they suffered. But they also did it because they knew that there was a reward coming. And this is something that maybe we don't talk about enough as Christians. If you're still in Matthew, look at verse 12. Well, let's, let's start in verse 9. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, so we don't lose heart. He's talking about all these afflictions he's experiencing. He said, we don't lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And there is this idea it seems that like they, they knew that all of this labor, all of this stuff they were going through, there was a reward. There was something coming at the end that was worth everything they were suffering. And people talk about, are there differences of rewards in heaven? And I don't know. I don't really know if that matters. I think what matters is that there is a reward, you know, and that we're encouraged not to give up, to press on and love others and tell the truth, even if it results in persecution, because there's a reward coming that's worth it. It's like <laughs> my friend Zach and I, we, we like to work out sometimes, and he hates working out with me because I, I have hard workouts. But um, he, <laughs> we have this little slogan we say. We say, pain now, glory later. <laughs> and so we'll be like doing push-ups or whatever, like, pain now, glory later. <laughs> but it's kind of that idea, you know? It's like the pain is now, the glory is later. The suffering is now, the reward is later. Sometimes we put way too much stock in this world, you know. This world is passing away. And I think Paul always kept this in mind. Look at his, what he says, some of the last words he wrote that we know of to Timothy. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And there's nothing like death to help us see how everything we've worked for down here is fading away. And it really makes you consider, is what I'm living for worth it? You know, Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 3 how, how someday uh, we're going to stand before God and be judged. And all of our works will be judged. You know, we talk about God's grace. And yes, that's how you become a Christian. That's how you go to heaven. That's how you have a relationship with him. But your works will be judged. And mine will too. And, and it'll be judged by fire. And everything that is burned up will be lost. And Paul said there's going to be some people who everything they did will be burned up. And they'll be saved, but it'll be like being saved through fire. And they'll suffer loss. He says that. They're going to suffer loss. And we don't know what that loss is. But he says, but if the work remains, if it stands the test of the fire, you will have a reward. And that's what Paul and his, his friends were living for. They were living for, to hear God say, well done, good and faithful service. And man, it's just such a good reminder to me, you know. Sometimes I struggle with the way I feel like God has called me to live my life. And I want to do different things. And God it's like reminding me what really matters, you know? Will my work stand the trial of fire? Or have I just been building with wood and hay and stubble? Is what I'm doing in life really matter? We've all got to work a job. We've all got to do things to make the ends meet. But what's my main pursuit in life? Is it to make money? Is it to get more comfortable? Or is Jesus and his kingdom the reason that I'm living? Is my life going to stand the test of the fire? So, they endured persecution out of love and obedience, and they knew there was a reward coming. And I think this is good for us to look at, too. How did they respond to it? The Bible shows us how we respond when we are treated shamefully. Now, I might, I want you to listen to me right now, and, and I want you to hear what I'm about to say, and then look at the scriptures and ask me if what I'm about to say is true. Because what I noticed when I was doing my study, it was really interesting, is that, like, in America, we have like two separate sufferings, 
What I mean is like we have the, someone is infringing on my rights suffering and we have the way we handle that. So for instance, if somebody comes and steals my stuff, uh, you know, tries to come and steal into my car or whatever, then in America, we say, I have the right to kill that person because they are possibly going to hurt me or take my stuff or whatever. They're on my property. You know, it's my right. And so with that suffering, we have kind of put it over here, and they're, they're attacking my rights category. And so I have the right to fight back, to be violent, to hurt, to kill, right? But then over here, we have the suffering as a Christian category. And we know if we suffer as a Christian that we ought to suffer like Jesus did, right? We ought to love our enemies. We ought to pray for them. We ought to give to them. And we ought to seek to be like Jesus to them, like he was when they crucified him on the cross, when he could have called down 12 legions of angels and killed them all. And what I've noticed is that we separate that in America, but the Bible really doesn't make that distinction at all. Because, like, what if someone is trying to steal your stuff because you're a Christian? What if someone's breaking into your car or breaking into your house because you're a Christian? What do you do then? Where do we draw the line of distinction of over here I defend my rights and over here I act like Christ? Where do we make that separation? And I don't see that separation at all in the Bible. Let me show you what I mean. Look at this. It says, oh yeah, how should we respond to persecution? Like Jesus, right? That's just... Period. But look at this. It says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So back then they had slaves. And he's telling them, hey, if you're a slave, here's how you should live as a Christian. Okay? And he says, this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering, suffering unjustly. This has nothing to do with being a Christian. Or what I mean is, he, this person is not suffering because they are a Christian. He says, Treat your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the just. He's saying, be a good servant, not only to the good masters, but also to the ones who are jerks. Not because you're a Christian, just because they're a jerk. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, you endure sorrow while suffering unjustly. What credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But, what, but when you do good and suffer for it and you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For you have been called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So here we see Paul is saying, hey, look, when suffering comes into your life, let me put it this way. If your boss at work is being a jerk to you, not because you're a Christian, just because he's a jerk, how are you supposed to respond? like Jesus. And if someone, I would go to say, if someone steals your stuff because you're a Christian or not, we're supposed to respond the way Jesus would, not the way Americans are told they should. There's no distinction between sufferings. Whenever suffering comes into our life from another person, we're called to love our enemies. Now, this is difficult. I mean, we always go to the extreme of what if someone's trying to kill me or my family or something like that, right? And I think we all have to wrestle with that and come to our own conclusions. But I think the point of what I'm trying to say is that we are called to love our enemies no matter why they bring suffering into our life. And that's important to remember because it's easy to get patriotic Americanism and Christianity mixed up to where we love people to a certain extent, but when they try to steal my stuff, kill my dog, steal my car, all bets are off and the guns are coming out, right? And... I don't see that distinction in the Bible. We need to be Christians, not Americanized Christians. So that is suffering just in general. Look at this. It says, this is suffering for being a Christian. It said, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so much as you share Christ's sufferings, so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you were insulted, listen to this. This verse kind of blew me away. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but glorify God in that name. Isn't that cool? And man, I was just thinking like, wow, just being insulted for the name of Christ. I don't know about you guys, but I've been insulted plenty of times in my job for the name of Christ, you know? Here comes with the Holy Ghost. Stuff like that, you know. Here comes the Holy Roller. 
here comes that Christian, you know, stuff like that. And isn't it, isn't it cool? He says, the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. How awesome is that? So, but again, the main point I'm trying to make here is how do we respond for Christians, as Christians? We're supposed to rejoice, and we're supposed to love. Let me give you one more passage. I know we're reading a lot of scripture, but this one really sums it up, I think. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Don't Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you. But do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Gentleness, respect, honor, rejoicing. Those are the ways we're supposed to respond as Christians, the way Jesus did. And I want to encourage you to think about the way you're handling conflict in your life, the way you're handling people who are treating you unjustly, whether it's for being a Christian or not. And ask yourself, am I responding the way Jesus would? Am I treating them with gentleness and respect, with honor and rejoicing that I have the opportunity to suffer and look like Jesus? Lastly, we'll end on this. What are the results of persecution for the church? And this is really neat. You know, it's difficult to understand why does God allow persecution. I've read some stories of Christians who have gone through some horrible things, and I still wrestle with it, you know? I say, God, why would you allow that for your children? And I think God, in his grace, has allowed us to exercise our free will, even to the extent that he allows evil people to hurt his children. If by any means their eyes would be opened to how messed up they are and how much they need to be saved, you know? He even allowed his own son, Jesus, to be murdered by wicked people. And one thing God does that turns persecution around is that he draws us deeper into our relationship with him. You see that in the Bible over and over. You know, Paul talks about how in 1 Corinthians, there's a lot about persecution in 1 Corinthians. And he talks about how they were in such a trial that he was so burdened that he didn't even want to wake up in the morning. He said, I despaired of life itself. And he said, but what this did is it led us to depend on God. And it's not like Paul wasn't depending on God, but this persecution led him to depend on God in a way that like was deeper. And he said, and God delivered us. And he came into a deeper fellowship with God through that. Look at this. This is cool. Look at how God used persecution in Paul's life. He says, I'm not speaking of being, he's in prison, he's writing to the Philippians, and they sent him a gift, and he's thanking him for it. And then he says, and I'm not speaking of being in need, because I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And Paul is saying, through the sufferings I've gone through, I've learned a secret. Through all this stuff that God has allowed to happen in my life, I've learned a secret that not everybody knows, and it's that I can do all things through Christ, that I can be content and satisfied and abounding with joy when I'm down at the bottom and when I'm up at the top. That's the secret. And God used that suffering in Paul's life. It's so cool, too, because Paul was a greedy person. He was ambitious. He wanted to be the best. He wanted to be the top. In Romans 7, at least that's what I see in the Bible, in Romans 7, he says the one sin he talks about in his life, the one that was foremost in his mind was covetousness. He says, I didn't know what coveting was until the law told me about it. But then sin came alive and I, I, I died. He was just saying covetousness like came alive in me. I knew what covetous was after I learned about God's law. And that was Paul. You know, he wanted to be the best. He wanted to be the top. You see him striving to destroy the church, to be the best Pharisee. He wanted it. He coveted. And then through this suffering, God takes this man who is a covetous person and he teaches him the secret of being content no matter what. Being content no matter if anybody else has more than you. Being content no matter if you're at the bottom. Isn't that amazing? God used that suffering from the devil of evil people to bring Paul into a deep relationship with him. That is so cool. It, i got to wrap up, but I mean... It's just so cool to see how God uses the tools of the devil to bring about good things. Like, like death 
You know, death is the devil's like trump card. You know, it's like death was the thing that the devil brought into the world. And it was the thing that kept us all in bondage. It's the last enemy that will be defeated. It's the greatest power of the devil. And how did God redeem people? He used death. Isn't that cool? Jesus used death to deliver us from the devil. He took the devil's trump card and used it against him. Isn't that neat? And he does the same thing with suffering. He uses what the devil brings into our life and he turns it for good. That is so neat how God does that. Another thing that it does is that God uses persecution to draw unbelievers to himself. When we respond correctly to persecution, God will use that to draw unbelievers to himself. When we act like the world when we're persecuted, we're just missing an opportunity. But when we respond in love, when we respond like Jesus when we're persecuted, it softens the hearts of those who know otherwise would have been softened. Look at this. He says, I want you to know, brothers. This is, again, the Philippian letter, and this is at the beginning. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, being imprisoned, has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Isn't that cool? It's like Paul says, man, I don't want to be in here, but I want you to know I'm seeing how God is using this to reach Roman guards, to reach, what did he say? Throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. It's like all these Roman soldiers that I never could have reached before. Now that I'm in prison and suffering, they all know why I'm here. And that is reaching people that never would have been reached before. Last week in youth, we watched a video about a guy named Richard Wormbrandt. Does anybody know? Or two weeks ago in youth. Uh, Richard Wormbrandt was uh, uh, Russian, I believe. He's from Russia, right? Russian pastor who was in prison for 14 years during uh, communist, uh, the, the Iron Wall, the Iron Curtain and stuff like that. And uh, he wrote a book when he got out uh, called Tortured for Christ. And he details the terrible things that happened inside the communist prisons. And it was really horrific. Um, but one of the things, many of the testimonies in there, so a lot of it's just like a bunch of short stories kind of put into chapters and stuff, but... A many, there are many testimonies in there of how his suffering would minister to the people who were jailing him. That sometimes the people who were interrogating him or were beating him even would become converted because of conversations they would have. And that's what Paul meant earlier when we read. He says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. He's saying, if the only way I can minister to this person is for, is for me to be thrown into a jail cell and then beat me, and that's the only way I will be able to have a ministry to this person, then I'll endure it for their sake. That's love, right? And, and, and it's how God turns persecution on its head. Is that the same people who are torturing and jailing and beating become tortured and jailed and beat because they become Christians. Uh, Richard would talk about, I think, how he would meet people who would, he would be in prison later with people who had before been his interrogators or whatever because they either got converted or the Communist Party turned against them, one or the other. But still, it's just cool, you know? It doesn't make it easy. But it is amazing how God turns persecution for good. So, just in closing, I guess the things I want you to think about today are That persecution has and it continues to be a part of the Christian life. If you are truly following Jesus, you will be persecuted. Anyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But even in our suffering, we have hope. We have a hope of reward in this life and in the life to come. And so the two things I want to encourage you is, first of all, like those Christian sewage workers in Pakistan, I want to encourage you to remember them and pray for them. I hope that all of us will have the privilege to stand beside them someday. You know what I mean? People who have literally, Paul said, you know, I feel like God has put his apostles as last, like the refuse of all the world, to be, to be looked at like, like poop. Seriously, you know? And these are guys who are literally, every day, working in sewage for the name of Jesus. And I hope someday we can stand beside them with the honor that they're going to receive in heaven.
Let's remember them in our prayers. And I think it would be good for all of us, too, to pray and ask God to help us to be more bold, to share the truth in love and not be afraid of persecution. Because I think if we're all honest, we all have a tendency to not want to be persecuted. We all have a tendency to be cowards. And I don't want that in my life, you know? And I have a lot of growing to do in that area. And I want to encourage you to ask God to help you in that area, too. That we as a church would speak the truth in love. Even if persecution comes, we would be bold. I I pray that God will do that in us. Worship team, you can come up. I'm going to pray. I encourage you, whatever God's speaking to you in your heart, just talk with him about that during the last song and let God minister to you. Thank you, Lord, that Lord, thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you promise, Lord, that you're always with us, no matter what comes. And Lord, we don't know what's going to happen in this country. We don't know what the future holds. We know the future's in your hands, Father. And I just pray, Lord, that you would make us sold out. God, that you would help us to be bold share the truth in love in our school, in our workplace. Lord, for people in here who are suffering, who are having conflict, Lord, I pray that you would help them to endure that suffering like you did, like you did, Lord. With gentleness and respect, with honor and rejoicing. And oh God, I pray that you'd have your way in us and our church. Help us to walk worthy, God, of this calling that you've given us. I know you will. I know, Lord, you never fail us. Thank you for that.